All right. Let's see what we have here. Hello. So this is this is uh, this is it. I'm going to make this video a few times, and it's going to be more streamlined in the future. But this is just like one of those moments of excitement where you come into an understanding of something, and it's so resonant that you need to share it with people because this is it. This is the answer to this whole one thousand year reign thing, and it is completely indisputable there's no recourse nothing you can say against it it makes complete sense and it fills my heart with joy because it's the truth it's so the truth and there's no getting around it and i'm so happy to share this so yeah um it's been said before it's been said before but i don't think i've said it before in my channel so i'm just going to rattle through some of this and then i'll get into the nitty gritty of it so you have this 1,000 year reign that's spoken about in the book of Revelation, okay? And um, there's different ideas about this. So you have the premillennial conceptualization, which is that Christ will initiate the 1,000 years. So that you get your new heavens and new earth at the end of the millennium. And then you've got your amillennial and postmillennial positions that agree that the millennium is the Christian age and Christ's coming at the end of the Christian age or the end of the millennium is how it should go. So uh, the, the amillennialists and the post-millennialists post -millennialists believe that Christ comes after. And then there's the preterist view, uh, which has the most explanatory power and makes the most sense. If you hear this video out, uh, it's, it's, it makes a lot more sense of the imminency. You know, the statements in like Luke, Luke 21, 8, where Jesus says, you know, if someone says the time is drawn near and you go after them, uh, you're doing wrong. So if for Christ to say that, and then for the New Testament to be riddled with statements saying it's the last hour, the time is drawn near, or salvation's closer than we first believed, he's at the doors. For all these things to be in there after Christ has said, people who say it's coming soon are false and you shouldn't follow them. That's an issue that needs to get unruffled. Then you get Luke 21, 22. These are the days of vengeance where all things written will be fulfilled. Like, how do you dissect that and make it not say what it's trying to say? Then you've got Luke 20, uh, sorry, Matthew 23 and 24. Matthew 23, where we're told all the righteous bloodshed in the earth will be exacted upon the brood of vipers to whose he's addressing. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You say you wouldn't uh, have persecuted and killed the prophets. So I'll send you wise men, I'll send you prophets, and you'll kill them. You'll be judged by your own uh, mouths. Um, Truly, I say all these things will come upon this generation. That's Matthew 23. I don't even need to touch Matthew 24. Uh, you've got Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. This, is, this is a juicy bit, man. We're coming into it now. So you have to see that, and it will make sense. This will make so much sense. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, you need to engage with that first verse because it's the book of things which must shortly come to pass. So how is there a thousand year reign in there? How is there a 1,000 year reign? in the book of things which must shortly come to pass, addressed to seven churches in the first century, who Jesus tells the congregations of to hold fast to what they believe and that some of them will even live to his coming. How, how do you marry up all those ideas that seem so terribly and acrimoniously divorced if you're a futurist? Well, I'll tell you. Um, so... Let's have a little look here. First of all, I want to address something because people who find this video might think to themselves, well, how is it that this idea hasn't got as much traction as we would expect? If this is the truth, why is it not as so pervasive? And again, I keep coming back to, have you ever heard of the Conventicle Act? Have you ever heard of people being murdered for not believing the right things? People being burnt to death at a stake for trying to translate the bible into english look at church history it is bloody and it is terrible it is devoid of the spirit of christ so if if the you know 
if the very enterprise of Christian religion has been so wickedly and demonically savaged throughout history, and that's even without looking at the, the bits where trying to get translations of the, of the Bible into good people's hands has failed and got people's hands chopped off, etc., without even looking at that part, just that whole enterprise of Christian religion has been a terrible thing to look at, just, just throughout the wiles of, of men, you know? You would know the nature of sin from James. It's, it comes into the minds of men. You don't need a Satan for that. You don't need um, some wicked, devious agent for that. We, as human beings, have the capacity to sin, but we don't need to get into any of that kind of stuff just now. Let's just let's just deal with this. Oh, and we're going to talk about the binding of Satan. And as soon as I've said that, I wonder if some verses have come into your head. I wonder if some verses have come into your head. So. Let's just get into this. Let's just get into this, okay? So we know why the truth isn't as pervasive as it should be because it's only in recent years we've had this opportunity to share. Um, so I'm of the view that the millennial reign, the 1,000-year period, was the period from Jesus's earthly ministry until approximately 70 AD uh, before the fall of Jerusalem, okay? So how can we make a 1,000 years a millennial reign fit into 40 years, how can that be done? The only way it can be done is if we're talking about uh, some kind of symbology here. If, if 1000 can speak more of a qualitative value as opposed to a quantitative value, and you wonder, can that be done? Has that ever happened? Well, if you look at Psalm 5010, you'll read there how Jesus, sorry, not Jesus, how God owns the cattle uh, on a thousand hills. And you can, someone went to point, well, how do you break that down? Does that mean 999 plus one, 999 plus one? Is that just 1,000 hills, God owns the cattle on them? No, it's talking about completion. It's talking about absolutes. It's just a grand, it's a grand thing. It's a qualitative thing. Okay. So let's have a little look here. So in Revelation 20, we're dealing with a time where Satan is bound, okay? We're dealing with a time where Satan is bound. And I've heard this said, you know, when has Satan ever been bound? We have never in the history of this world seen Satan bound. It's never happened. And as soon as I'm saying this now, there's people watching this thinking, oh, wait. Oh, no, wait. It, it, does, it says that, doesn't it? It actually says Satan was bound during Jesus' ministry. It does. It's just, it's just struck people. And, you know, that's coming from a good place. You should listen to that. So we're told in the in the uh, ministry of Jesus at Matthew 12, uh, he's casting out demons. He's casting out demons. And people say to him, oh, you know, he's only doing that because he's got some kind of demonic spirit within him. And he's like, you know, a house divided against itself cannot stand. You know, unless he first you, you first bind the strong man. So let's just pause and let's just acknowledge that in Matthew 12, during the earthly ministry of Christ, we have Jesus telling us that Satan is bound. Is anyone going to dispute that? Is anyone going to argue that point? If you want to argue that point, you can try. Sounds a lot like Jesus is saying Satan is bound. And so he has this ability to operate in this way. Okay. And then if you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're told about this man of sin. Okay. This agent of Satan who's already alive. Who's already alive. And Paul says to them, you know who is restraining him even now. Okay. So it's hard to restrain someone that's not there. So we know this, this spirit of lawlessness is already at work, okay? And, and there's a time where this restraining will, restrain will be taken away, okay? So Satan is bound, but he's loosed at the end of the millennium and then destroyed at the coming of the Lord. So we can see this there. That all, that all kind of marries up. That all kind of makes sense. So we actually have in the ministry of Christ the binding of Satan. So there we have an aspect of revelation that lots of people wonder about and are curious of, when could this possibly happen? Why wouldn't you apply it to when Jesus says Satan is bound? Why wouldn't you do that? 
does it not make sense to do that? The only reason not to do that would be to try to align yourself with a tradition that rejects such an idea on the basis of nothing at all. Whereas what I've shared with you now has complete and utter synthesis of idea. It's the same thing. It's Jesus saying, Satan is bound. Okay? Bound. The strong man is bound and I'm doing my work. And that's what we see fulfilled in Revelation. Again, I will make this video more concise and punchy, but right now I'm just happy to have come across these things. Um, yeah, so we can talk about um, the martyrs now. We can talk about the martyrs. I did this, I've touched on this a wee bit before, and it ends on the point at Matthew 23. But um, we see the martyrs are seated in thrones, okay? They're made kings and priests. They're raised up and sat on thrones, okay? And this it's important to look here at Ephesians chapter 2. Um, but if we look at Revelation, you know, John sees these martyrs who have been uh, beheaded, okay, for their witness and for following Christ. And uh, it's like, you know, it's like this kind of revelation. You know, we'll see this in Ephesians 2 1 onwards. And, uh, you know, what it says, you who are dead have been made alive. You know, so there's some kind of uh, resurrection being discussed here. It, you can't really dispute that fact, it's there. Uh, what it says, you know, we've been raised up together with him and seated in heavenly places. So, you know, in Ephesians uh, 1, 19 onwards, we can read that we're raised up with Christ, okay? We're on his right hand. And, you know, that, uh, sorry, Christ has been raised up to the right hand of God and has been given a, a name above every name in this age and age to come. And, you know, we're, we're uh, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, okay? And we see these saints that have been sat on these thrones. Um, in Revelation 6, 9 to 11, John saw those who were beheaded, right? The souls of the martyrs, okay? And it's not necessarily Christians. It's down through the centuries. And they cry out for vengeance. And they say, how long, O Lord? Uh, how long will you not avenge us? And they were given white robes and told to rest a little while. Now, that's a key point. That is a key point. How long are they told to rest for? A little while. And then what follows then uh, after the filling of the number of the martyrs is the great and terrible day of the Lord. But what you're supposed to notice here is the robes, okay? And if you look at the text, if you look at the original, uh, it talks about robes of royalty, okay, which is equivalent to thrones. So um, we see these people rev uh, in Revelation 6 martyred for the word of God. And then in Revelation 20, we have this parallel where you see them uh, given um, uh, robes and so sorry, pardon me. It's robes in Revelation six, and it's thrones in Revelation twenty. So we see this idea of ruling and reigning with Christ for the one thousand years. Okay, and then what? Uh, at the end is the coming of the Lord and the judgment of those outside the city. Okay, the resurrection of the rest of the dead, the fulfilling of the martyrs. Okay, so. We have this 1,000 year reign, and it is a, a symbolic number, as we've discussed, okay? Waiting for the consummation of things. Um, so in, in Revelation 6, the martyrs have to wait the same period as those in uh, Revelation 20. Sorry, this is the, the, I'm not putting this together in a very eloquent way, but let me, let me get it all together. So, um, yeah. So that's the point there. So in Revelation 6 and in Revelation 20, you've got the same idea of the martyrs who are sat on thrones, okay? And the period of time in Revelation 20 is a thousand years, okay? And it's the same people we're talking about. It's those martyred, right? It's those martyred. And vengeance hasn't been given out yet. In Revelation 6, it's the same idea. So if in one place they're told to wait a millennium, but then in the other place they're told to wait how long? a little while until the measure of the martyrs is filled. Oh my goodness, futurist, what are you going to do? Because and how is a thousand years a little while? How is a thousand years, a millennium, a little while? Well, there's only one way that it is. If we're talking about something symbolic, something qualitative and not quantitative, something symbolic and rich, full of meaning and not necessarily a 
carnal metric that you're supposed to just read in a very surface level way. So that's something to look at. Revelation 6, Revelation 20, see the ideas being discussed. See that we're discussing these martyrs that are supposed to rule with their, with their uh, thrones and with the royal robes. See that there's a thousand year reign. See that there's a little while. Are you going to try and push away the little while in this book of things which must shortly come to place, Revelation 1.1? Are you going to push away the little while and emphasise and overstate and misinterpret the 1,000 years? Why would you do that? What is that an exercise in? Who are you serving? The father of lies or the father of light? The spirit of truth or the spirit of lawlessness? Have some measure of this uh, discernment in your heart. It's true. It's the, the truth is evident and blazing in its radiance. And even once you've looked at all this, even once you've looked at Revelation 6 with the martyrs, Revelation 20 with the martyrs, and you hear their cry, How long, O Lord? Look at Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Jesus is laying into them. 32 to 37 in Matthew 23, he says, Fill ye up then the measure of your father's guilt. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, I really regret this, this is a King James version. Behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them, you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zedekiah, son of Barachus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and you would not. This is it. This is it. This is it. And that, Matthew 23, that condemnation, all the righteous bloodshed on the earth coming upon them, that upon you, May come all the righteous bloodshed on earth. He's addressing a first century, first century audience. And if you don't think he's doing it there, is he doing it when he says, you shall not taste death or the son of man come in his kingdom? Is it happening when he says, hold fast until I come? Verily I'm at the doors. Is, is it there when, when Paul says, our salvation draws nearer than we first believed? Is it there when John says, it's the last hour? Is it there when he says it in Matthew 23, these things will come upon this generation? Where is it? Is it there in Luke 21, 22, when he says, these are the days of vengeance, that all things will be written? Where, where, when will you see it? Where will you see it? And another thing, I mean, the Christian age has no end. People who expect a, a termination of things, of his governance and peace, there will be no end. Uh, there's nothing after the Christian age. We live in the victory. We live in the victory. Okay. Um, the last idea I haven't really fully fleshed out completely. I just heard it and scribbled down some notes, which I've done with this whole video. But you can hear the, you can hear the truth in it. You know what's been said. I think the last point here is to do with the... Uh, people uh, being raised up as, as kings and priests and how we're told in Hebrews 13, 15 and 1 Peter 2, 5 uh, and in other places that, you know, we're, we're living stones and we're building a, a spiritual house, a spiritual priesthood to offer up, offer up sacrifices that are acceptable to Christ. You know, this is the messianic temple. This is in spirit and truth, you know. Um. In Revelation 20 and the millennium, you know, being sat in these thrones in these robes, it, it's clear to see that, you know, this is something that was happening in the first century. That's the point that's being made here. I mean, Paul speaks of it as a reality in the first century, that they are living as kings and priests. They've been raised up as kings and priests, okay? 
um, those martyred and, and to be martyred isn't necessarily to be killed, you know. You can be a martyr in your life as well. Um, so yeah, this was a reality that was already existing in the first century as per the testimony of the saints. Um, but I just think that's that's something that needed to, to, needed to be said, needed, needed to be put out there. And I can flesh this out and I can make this idea a lot more attractive to people, but everyone who's heard this message will know that this is this is making sense because people often struggle with this thousand years, but it's evident to see that everything described as happening in this 1,000 years happened in the first century. It did. You can't argue it. All you can say is, oh, no, but it must happen again later. All you can say is, I can see what you're saying, and I understand that it did happen in the first century as per the testimony of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, because he seemed to heavily suggest that it all happened in the first century, but it happens again. And I'm just like, oh, really? Does it? Does it happen again? Because I missed the bit where it says this will happen twice. This is all going to play out twice, once for them in the first century, and then once for us, once for us. Because where is that coming from? This, why do you feel like it needs to happen to you? That is completely egoic. You know, that is completely self-centered. That is just self-centeredness to, to, to it, put yourself in that position. It's ridiculous. It's an exercise in childishness. Anyway, I think the point's been made perfectly clear and evident. It's indisputable that these things that were said to happen in this 1,000 year reign happened in the first century. We can't get past it. It happened in the first century. Um, I don't really have much else to say in this video. I want to leave it short. I might do another wee hang sesh where I'll speak in more uh, <laughs> gibberish terms, but this is enough for now. So thank you for watching. The points have been made. I'll expand upon them later once I've got this boiled down, but I feel like that just does it. I don't think anyone watching this video could uh, could complain. It's there. It's evident. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it stands out. It's like, wow, it happened. You know, it actually happened. And uh, you, I mean, what what can you say? What can you say that I'm I'm delusional? I'm delusional. Because I'm literally reading what Jesus said and I'm seeing this great synthesis between ideas. And it's it's not it's not an it's not a, a coming from a place of strivings. I don't have to put that much effort into this. I just need to say there's the idea. Here's what Jesus said. Satan was bound. Jesus said Satan was bound. You know? And you know, we have this idea of a war in heaven in Revelation. And then we have this position, this place where Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. We, we, we see the ideas in Revelation played out in the ministry of Christ. I, uh, I was a fan of a, of a film. I was a fan of a film. I'm not going to say the film because it's a horror film and people might not be happy with the genre. But I watched this. I was really quite into this film. Uh, it was kind of shabbily made, but it was it was cool. It was good and uh, good work from the guy who directed it, you know, on a small budget. And then they made the second film. And the second film um, kind of recapped everything that happened in the first film and then told the rest of the story. And yeah, I liked the second film. I actually preferred it. It's one of my favourite uh, horror films. And it's kind of like what John's done. John has, uh, if we if we believe it's, you know, John the Beloved that wrote Revelation. Some people can test that, but it's not important. If we believe that, well, let's say, well, it's for this point, I suppose. So John, in his vision, he records basically what's happened in the ministry of Christ right up into the point of... Uh, the Acts of the Apostles, right up to the point of the destruction of the temple, and then afterwards talking about the new heavens and new earth, the new covenant. So he's kind of he's recapping, he's he's discussing things that are happening and have happened, you know, and then he's he's doing it in this really rich uh, Hebraic hyperbole, 
it's it's amazing it's beautiful to read but it doesn't make a lot of sense unless you follow the ideas it, it, there's no point reading into the text things that are not supposed to be read into the text you have to look at it and say is there a way i can break this down and understand it in a way that makes complete and total sense does that have does that exist is that an option y yes it is well then the thing to do is to accept that it is not then just to reject everything that makes sense okay so quickly to recap then um okay so satan being bound okay that was the first point okay satan being bound this happened in Matthew 12. It's, the, it's happened in the life, in the ministry of Christ, okay? Um, the man of sin being restrained, Second, Second Thessalonians 2, it happened there, okay? Um, the next thing was like uh, the, the martyrs, okay? So in Revelation 6 and in Revelation 20, we have the martyrs being described as adorning robes and sitting on thrones until the completion of those slain for the word of God has reached its fulfillment. In the one place, millennial. In the other place, how long are we to wait? A little while. In Matthew 23, Jesus says to woe you scribes and Pharisees who say you wouldn't kill the prophets. They'll send you wise men and, and you'll kill them and upon you will be all the righteous bloodshed of the earth. Verily I say unto you, all this will happen upon this generation. And then we've got Luke 21, 22. Every, this is the, the, these are these vengeance where all things written will be fulfilled. And then reigning as, as kings and priests, uh, just the idea there that this is something that's described to happen during the millennial, but also this is a this is the reality of the first century. So then the millennium must be that time between the ministry of Jesus right up until approximately 70 AD before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the falling of the temple. Total sense total sense it would take effort to miss this it would be a deliberate act of self-deceit to reject this that's why i'm a preterist because if you're not a preterist you're really 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 trying to miss the truth you're trying so hard to miss the truth and i don't understand why you would do it okay thank you guys thank you so much i want to end this one here just leave it on topic and I'll try and refine the arguments and get it condensed down to like a 10 minute video in the future because it's beautiful. Maybe get some of the scriptures up in the screen because that works well. Any comments, you can leave them in the comment section below. Thank you so much. I might make another repost video after this just to have a wee chat about these ideas. God bless.